Happy Monday. Happy Monday. How's it going, Joe? Good. How's your weekend? Uh, it was good. Lots of work on the book this weekend. Yep. Took care of a few car maintenance issues and errands and such. So Sounds how about fun. yourself? I hear you have a new member of the household. Yeah, yeah. we uh, impulsively bought a new uh, golden doodle puppy the other day. So uh, uh, my kids were begging for one, I guess, as kids are uh, want to do. So, and um, I'm not much of a dog guy, but I got to say, I, I absolutely adore this this uh, new puppy. She's she's very cute. So I think this is a, it's a good addition to the house. So, yeah, yeah. They have a way of winning you over. They really do. Yeah. Depends yeah, on the absolutely. dog, of course. Like, yeah. <laughs> I've had some terrible dogs in my time, which yeah, is just yeah. why I'm not much of a dog person, but uh, exactly. Yeah. You know, but I've had some great dogs too. And I think she's going to be great. So yeah, it's yeah. cute. Maybe we'll have her on the show pretty soon. She's taking a nap right now, but uh, yeah, other than that, then went running up uh, Mount Olympus this morning uh, real quick. And so I'm nice and uh, cardio for, for the day. So very nice. Okay. Yeah, awesome. But uh, yeah, so I think we wanted to talk about um, a question that we get asked often. And most recently, uh, I got asked a question about um, you know, the other day uh, on, a, on a post that I, I made on you know, this talk here, what the, what the, what the F is data engineering, uh, which is a talk I gave last week for uh, AI Which, startup San Francisco. Let's um, keep this PG. This is a family podcast. Family pod. Yeah, <laughs> I got a puppy now. So, um, but the question was, you know, from, from your experience, what kinds of questions should data scientists, data engineers ask each other to make sure they're on the same page of the data product they're building? Um, I think we're going to extend this question to kind of a more broad theme of yeah. communication between data scientists and data engineers. So... Yeah. And I, I think this was kind of what motivated both of us to want to start this company. I mean, when we met a few years ago, we were both thinking of starting consulting companies that would focus on data engineering specifically to facilitate data science. I mean, we also do a lot of work with analysts and other stakeholders these days, but that was originally what got us moving in this direction. And so this is a very important question for us. Yeah, it really is. And we always harp on, you know, how we're, uh, uh, you know, a lot of data practices, well, I mean, practices anywhere, in, yeah. you know, in, in a corporation or a company, I mean, it's, it, you can say that it's, it's you, you can focus on the technology and tools, but inevitably it comes back to simple things like communication, which really aren't mm -hmm. um, like technological um, solutions or problems. It really just comes down to uh, basic stuff like talking to coworkers. And in this case, your coworkers are going to be your data scientists, your data engineers, so do you want to kick it off and maybe go through some of the, um, maybe some of the challenges that we see, maybe some of the, the, the bad patterns out there? Yeah, yeah. So some of the bad patterns that I think we've both experienced, well, the, the number one bad pattern is just siloing, right? So mm -hmm. fundamentally, our notion is that data engineers exist, they, they get hired, they get trained to serve use cases, to serve data to other consumers. Uh, but often we've seen the pattern where data engineering team gets hired, they kind of develop their own notion of what they're supposed to be doing. They build out a bunch of interesting data sets, but those data sets don't necessarily get consumed if there's no communication between the consumers and the producers. And then on the other side, um, you know, data science has tended to be this very ad hoc profession. You know, you grab a laptop, you install Python, you install R, you install a handful of tools, and then you just start building locally on your local machine. And again, if, if that happens, like that's a great way to start. But if there's no communication from that data scientist, the data engineer, then the needs of data science don't really get served very well. Like data scientists spend a lot of their time just being kind of ad hoc data engineers. In other words, downloading data sets, maybe from APIs, maybe from public files, and then trying to make sense of them, uh, trying to clean the data without getting help from the professionals who are trained to do this task in an automated fashion. And so right. there's just like a lot of wheel spinning, a lot of wasted effort, a lot of good work that never gets deployed because there's no communication between the people who are doing that work, exploring the data and the people who are actually capable of deploying it, the data engineers, the ops engineers and others. Right. Yeah. It's just, I'd say it's starting to happen. Uh, I, I would say maybe that data scientists and data engineers are, are becoming more aware of mm -hmm. maybe the communication barriers that used to exist, but yeah. Yeah. The classic thing was just a data side, the lone data scientist, um, you know, cracking away on a laptop and, yep. you know, producing Jupyter notebooks that may yield interesting results on that notebook, on that laptop, but aren't broadly distributed. You know, or repeatable, right? Repeatable. If, if yep. no one 
yeah, like often you don't even know what steps you took to clean that data by the time you're done. And so there's no way to put that into production without like kind of reinventing the wheel. Each mm -hmm. time. Yeah. yeah. And, and there are some cultural tendencies that have encouraged this too. So, you know, boot camps are great for data science, but boot camps don't, they, they often teach laptop skills. They often do not teach communication skills and productionization mm -hmm. skills. Kaggle too, it's like, okay, it's awesome that you're, you're exploring this data, you're developing new techniques to get value out of this data and competing, but are you learning how to do that in a production environment? Not necessarily. There's a transition required to move those skills into production. And that's where data scientists and data engineers need to be communicating and having some common incentives to work together. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, these are classic problems, but you know, what are what are some solutions? Yeah, so <laughs> we came up with a long list of solutions. Yeah. Um, I, I think one of the critical things is just better mutual appreciation between the two. So, so some of my solutions are a little bit vague, and then you you got down to some very concrete ones, which we'll come to in a minute. But in other words, I think it's very important for data engineers to understand what data scientists bring to the table. Mm -hmm. um, I, to be frank, and you know, I've been guilty of this too sometimes, mea culpa, um, data engineers can be a bit dismissive for, towards data scientists because on the engineering side, you know, data engineers have these awesome cloud skills, they build complex systems, they automate, they're generally not messing around with stuff on laptops. And so they can be a bit dismissive towards the contributions of data scientists. Um, the important thing for every data engineer to understand is that as we're fond of saying, like data scientists in some sense know where the bodies are buried. In other words, they have like a deep understanding of the data that they explore. They, they know stuff about it that would take you a long time yep. to reproduce. And so you need to be talking to them and understanding the data and getting value from their contributions. Um, on the other hand, you know, I, I think data scientists really need to understand the value that data engineers bring to the table, that they can make the data scientist's life a lot easier and more efficient. Yeah. Yeah, empathy is a it's a wonderful thing. So, mm -hmm. and and again, that, that's why we, we you mentioned that you know these uh, solutions aren't very technology heavy, right? right. I mean, it's just basic um, communication one on one, and so just go talk to your counterparts and just understand what they're doing, understand what they need, vice versa, understand what's working, what's not working. I think a great way to do this is just um, you know. Uh, if you're on a team um, together, stand-ups and sprints work wonderfully. Plan your work yep. together. Try and work in a single piece workflow as well, where the, the body of work that you're doing has a sense of um, like real-time collaboration. Where this starts going wrong is when you have very disjointed workflows. Mm -hmm. um, you know, say you're working on a data product, for example, uh, you know, data engineer over here is working on something that's completely um out of sync with the type of work a data scientist is doing. I am a fan of just making sure that uh, workflow is as um, harmonized as possible because this reduces errors and defects and waste, as they say, in kind of lean management. Um, so yeah, and in high functional organizations, data engineers and data scientists are communicating constantly, right? So other yeah. things you could do is pair program. Um, and enforce yeah. it, right? Like make yeah. rules about pair programming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this brings people closer to the work. Yeah. Uh, you know, obviously there's going to be some some crossover where you know if a data would a data scientist help with a Kafka pipeline, for example. I don't know. Yeah. So, but they maybe should have some uh, say in terms of like the uh, you know the inputs and outputs that might be useful. Exactly. Like more like what's the message going to look like? Even and we can extend this out to like application developers, for example. That's another area where you see a lot of siloing where application developers know that their work is going to be consumed downstream by data scientists. But if they're not talking, then they may format the data or the message in a way that's very hard to untangle. It requires a lot of work to get sense out of it. Yeah. And that's where like the data engineer, I mean, the data engineer runs the risk of playing middleman here Yeah, or middlewoman. Um, yeah. But the, the problem with that is if you, you know, it's a game of telephone. So right. Uh, yeah, if you're an application developer in your sprint, um, you know, if you're, if you're producing something that's going to be used downstream, it's best to get the data engineer and the data scientist together in one room and plan out this work and plan out the deliverable. Because the thing that's going to happen is inevitably um, the outputs aren't going to match the inputs and, right. and the workflow. And then then this is why I'm a big fan, you know, just like I said, single piece workflow as much as you can. Make sure, you know, it's a unit of work that you're all trying to build together. So it'll yeah. go a lot faster. It may seem like it goes slow, uh, but you know when you're working on, um, you know, one workflow. This also means that there's a you know an error in this workflow, 
uh, you can address it immediately. It's just, this is pretty standard DevOps stuff and data ops. Exactly. Um, yeah. I, one positive trend I've seen is that application developers are starting to have more of a stake in data science products. Mm -hmm. And so I think in the old days, which is probably like five or 10 years ago, it's not that long ago, but, but there was this tendency to say, okay, I'm an app developer. I'm creating, you know, this iPhone app. I'm just going to work kind of in isolation. And then down the line, you know, we'll kick it down to the data scientists and they're going to come up with a recommender. So for example, I might be a Spotify developer working on the app. Don't worry about the recommender. I worry about the app. There yeah. you go. Well, increasingly though, the recommender is seen as part of the product. It's like a core part of Spotify. And therefore I, as the app developer, want that recommender experience to be as good as possible. Therefore, I bring the data scientist in early and I say, hey, you know, what features are going to be interesting for you guys? Let's start talking about that now. And then we're going to constantly iterate on that and make it agile and, you know, adjust the messages and the events that pass downstream to data scientists. Mm -hmm. um, and I think another thing that's showing up a lot now is what we call uh, user facing analytics, where instead of analytics going downstream to the app, hitting data science and then hitting business, the user themselves can see analytics on their SaaS product or whatever. Yep. And again, that pulls the application developer right into the process of data science, um, understanding why it's important and why their users want it. And so I think anything that you can do to create common incentives to say, both the data scientists, well, all three, data scientists, data engineers, software developers are all responsible for this data science product, work together, figure it out. Yep. Yeah, that's a big one for sure. And we have, we have quite a few clients doing, you know, embedded analytics right now and, you know, embedded kind of self-serve dashboards for end users. And yeah, it's changing a lot, which yeah, definitely means the application developer needs to be brought into the discussion like immediately yeah. and helping drive the, uh, you know, the implementation and the, the build. Um, you know, also uh, mutual engagement, mutual incentives, right? So if people work on the same team uh, or if they don't, make sure incentives are aligned. Um, right. You know, if there's a common reporting structure, great. If not, um, you know, just make sure that teams are incentivized to work together and deliver uh, tools and products that are mutually beneficial. So, exactly. And to the point where you, if you're a data science manager or a software development manager, um, call out the other teams when you succeed, you know, like, hey, it's awesome. We all work together. We delivered this new recommender. Look at the results we're getting from this. Make sure that you shine a light on the people who helped you, because if you do, they're going to help you in the future. Like you're mm -hmm. all going to look good together instead of looking bad <laughs> separately by not getting work done. Yeah. And in some, and I would say in some cultures, making the other person look bad is part of the incentive structure. Right? Yes. This happens, um, you know, and I would say that's a sign of a, you know, pretty toxic workplace, but this yep. does happen. Um, and so that's the reality of it. Some teams are incentivized to make the other ones look not so great. So, you know, if that's the case, you know, uh, do your best. And if it doesn't work, then it's probably other places you can go work. So, yeah. Yeah, it's the organizational rot problem, right? I mean, this is a huge topic, but if the incentives are all about stick and punishment and not carrot, and then that, that's yeah. not a pleasant place to work. It turns toxic and yeah. probably not going to get great results. Yeah, I mean, as Charlie Munger always says, show me yeah. the incentives and I'll show you the outcome. So, yeah. But, you know, incentives are, uh, work wonders. And I'd say, you know, teams that are aligned in data science and data engineer, they, they tend to work really well together. So. Yeah. Um, and then finally, I would say you know, the technical solutions, once you got communication incentives aligned, technology, uh, this is where you document stuff. Again, I would yeah. say this is maybe a technical discussion, but it's really just a best practice discussion. I mean, sure, you could write documentation on loose leaf paper as you want, as long as somebody else can understand what's going on, um, whether it's a workflow, uh, data issues or what data means, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like, this is basic data management stuff. Yeah. Um, both teams need to be working on this. Yeah. And I, I, this is where I'll loop back to the siloing between data scientists and data engineers. I think one of the common problems is that they tend to use somewhat different tools. Data scientists tend to use R and, and Python pandas tools that data engineers aren't quite as interested in. And data engineers, you know, tend to use like PySpark, SQL, other things, um, but have the documentation and then explain it to each other, right? Like they're perfectly, these teams are perfectly easy. Uh, capable of speaking each other's language so long as there's open communication. You can sit down and explain to me what your R notebook does. And I would be like, okay, so here you're aggregating, here you're taking statistics. Great. I get it. Same thing, you know, data engineers should explain their work to data scientists in a way that's going to help them to do their jobs. And the documentation facilitates that if you add the extra step of actually communicating. So documentation just doesn't sit there and rot with no one looking yeah. at it. Yeah. This repair programming comes in handy, right? Yeah, it's if exactly. you're kind of tied together, then or, or just re code reviews, even if you're not going to pair program yeah. and then review the code or at least understand what's in it. And 
So this, this loops back to stuff like version control, for example, and now you, you know, maybe, you know, it's for code and for data uh, version controls. I say data version controlling is a, a bit more, uh, you know, new uh, mm-hmm. on the scene, um, you know, as a practice, but code version control has been around for a very long time. And if you're not doing it, please start. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, this is a great idea. I mean, this is something we didn't even talk about before the call, but the idea of having code reviews across teams. So say when your data scientist puts in a pull request, the data engineers have to review it just to understand what they're doing. So they get like eyes on to whatever data transformation process they're developing. Yeah. I mean, this would be yeah, a, a good practice cool. of data ops. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So cool. Anything I, I think, else? What's up? Oh, I was just going to say on version control, one, one pattern we've seen is that just by virtue of backgrounds, um, data engineers are more likely to version control than data scientists. Yeah. So if you're running data science teams, like make sure that your data scientists are version controlling even single laptop, especially actually single as, uh, laptop yeah. assets like notebooks that would just get lost if someone you know loses their uh, loses their laptop on a flight. Like you want to make sure that that stuff gets checked in somewhere and that other people can get eyes on it. For sure. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Cool. Um, anyway, this I think it's going to be maybe the first and you know maybe several discussions on yeah this communication patterns with uh, data scientists, data engineers, and just kind of the broader organization. It. it because again, this seems to be where things have kind of fallen apart, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and things where things also succeed quite well. But, and it's also, I would say, a key reason why we even started, you know, our company in the first place. Mm-hmm. So we just kept seeing, you know, that the, of course, there's the issue of, um, you know, data scientists going out and just, you know, going straight into doing AI and ML without building a proper data foundation. I think that was one yeah. of the core tenets of why we took off on our path. But then there's also the organ, but yeah, that, I think that's also symptomatic of an organizational issue too. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe the data scientist is being pushed to get these types of results, uh, maybe prematurely uh, without building the foundation. Um, you know, and we've seen this happen where, where companies will hire an analyst of data scientists, expect them to, you know, also build the, uh, the data infrastructure in place. And so, so we, we have, you know, lots of discussions with these these types of people about, okay, so how do I convince my boss to hire a data engineer or, you know, what's the best way to go about doing this? And, and but I think a lot of it does come back to communication with, with stakeholders as well. And this is just something mm-hmm. that doesn't go away. Like I don't, for, for as much technological improvement as there has been uh, and sophistication improvement as there has been in the data space, it, it still uh, clearly comes back to just basic communication, talking to people. It's a weird idea, but you should try it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, yeah, communication makes all the difference. I, I was going to, you know, this notion of quick win- wins, right? I don't think quick wins are necessarily a bad thing, but quick wins can be a bad thing if they exclude the long-term wins, the foundations. And that, that's what we've seen sometimes. Sometimes they're even like fake quick wins, right? Like you just happen to grab some data that looks good. It's not statistically significant. You show it off and you make someone look good. Yep. And that's your entire job, right? Yeah. Yeah, kind we of talk, we talk, to Potemkin. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say Potemkin data, data science and data engineering. We talked about this last week and it's, it's so true. Yeah. There's just, there's a lot of theatrics uh, behind yeah. the scenes. And so yeah. I guess you just need to know what, what, what play you're a, you're a cast member in. Cause I would say, you know, regardless of where you work, there is some amount of theater to it. And that's just kind of mm-hmm. how it is. Like you're out and it sounds crass, uh, but that is true. <laughs> Oh, I agree. Yeah, a lot of leadership is theater. The point is, are you incentivized just by the theater or are you actually trying to do real work and make your company better and build interesting things? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. There's a lot of what I call credit, credit harvesting even where people just go around trying to take credit for things and look good without actually doing any real work. Like it goes on quite this happen, This happens in every field and in every industry. You know, I mean, I was rereading the, uh, the, the book, The Peter Principle, which I, I, you know, for any listeners out there, I would say that is if you want to know how to get ahead in your organization, yeah. even though this book is written in 1969, I think it's still like the number one book for, um, you know, career progression. And what it talks about is, is basically this. Um, don't, so, don't focus so much on your skills or building yeah. up your talent, focus on find, finding the, the person who's going to help you, uh, move up in your, the career ladder at your company. Um, and, and, cause like skills, uh, and, um, you know, these tangible progressions that you think are important in most situations are not important at all. It's all about making sure that you can find somebody who can help accelerate your career. And it's, it's, it's crass, uh, but you know, I, I've seen this enough personally. I'm just glad to, you know, to reread this and think, oh yeah, this is, um, 
this is pretty damn true actually. So, and it's, it's sort of an immutable law where yeah, you can, yeah. and I think as technicians, right, we, we focus on developing our skills, which is incredibly important and you should keep doing this, but just understand there's, there's a whole, other, whole other aspect to, um, to working with people that has nothing to do with, with, uh, you know, engineering skills and data science skills has everything to do with just, um, you know, how you understand how this theater is uh, played out at work. And yeah. so this, again, to bring it back full circle, though, this does impact how communication occurs. Yeah. So. Well, it, it impacts how work gets done, right? Like often we see really talented data scientists just kind of get relegated to some corner somewhere because they can't do the organizational behavior parts of their job, which is, you know, even if they're not a manager, just orchestrating other people to work together toward mm -hmm. a common goal and actually getting that goal noticed, finding budget indirectly by finding people who invest in your skills, yep. getting things deployed, getting things to customers. Like those are very important organizational skills that completely align with what you're talking about. Bingo. And if you get sidelined, I mean, according to Peter principle, you've, you've hit the level of your, uh, the highest level of your incompetence and that's where you're <laughs> going to stay. Yeah. Like that's, that's your last job at that company. So yeah, yeah. Um, so I would say, yeah, as, as a, a tangent, which I think we can talk about in probably another talk, but just how to, how to navigate through a company, um, this, this does largely dictate how the communication occurs just by, by definition of Conway's law, which is that you're going to build systems that, um, you know, basically reflect the way your company communicates with, with itself. And so yeah. if you're yeah. very siloed, you're going to build very siloed communication, uh, systems and that's, you know, and systems that reflect that silo and that's how it is. So, yeah. 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 Maybe all of this has a whiff of the office of office space, right? Which is mm -hmm. a nineties. And the office. Yes, yeah. We're old. Um, but yeah, go, go watch office space. It will change your life. If you're like a young person just getting into this field. <laughs> so. mm -hmm. Yep. It's true. Yeah. So yeah, I think to recap though, for, you know, the ways data scientists and data engineers uh, can communicate better, I would say just go communicate, um, yeah. figure out, you know, go talk to your counterparts, uh, mm -hmm. you know, code reviews, uh, sprint planning, standups, all this stuff, like make sure you're aligned, single piece workflow, uh, yep. you know, documentation, version control, everything else. And correct tools, right? Correct the technology tools. is important. In other words, you need to have a place for version control, a yep. place to see commits, a place to do documentation where other people can find it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. And then just constantly iterate and just know that you'll probably get it wrong the first few times or first several times. And this is always like an influx thing. You always just got to, if the process isn't working, don't give up on it. Just make sure right. you find out a way to make it work. Yeah. So. I mean, in some sense, getting it wrong is a sign that you've gotten into a creative domain where you're actually trying yeah. new things. If you always get it right, then you're probably trying stuff that's actually pretty well-worn that's not going to deliver any new value. Mm -hmm. Or does that also mean that maybe that's a good thing? That you always get it right? Well, I mean, if, if, if you get certain things right, yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. That, that, you know... Because the things you want to get wrong are the things that are like hard yeah. uh, that, you know, uh, but th those that would lead me to think that that's more, like more the area of where true creativity and things come into play where you're focusing on like yeah. an actual competitive advantage. But, if, you know, if you, if you fail a lot trying to get a Git repo stood up, for example, like that would indicate to me that you, you need to um, pay more attention. Yeah. That, that's pretty yeah. routine. That makes sense. So you're saying like the easy stuff you should be getting right consistently, the hard stuff you should fail at, which comes back to, you know, the discussions of DevOps principles and yep. agile and everything else. Yeah. Yeah. At least it's a supposition for today. So, yeah, but, but cool. Anyway. Um, yeah. Looking forward to talking more about these types of topics. Um, yeah. It, it's funny in the office hours that we do and people that we talk to, which is, it's, it's amazing how much, you know, we, we talk about tech, technology a lot. Uh, I mean, yeah. we, we are, you know, data engineers and so forth, but it, it really yeah. comes back to communication and that's just right. kind of how it is. So, yeah. Well, cool. Uh, well, have a good week and talk to you next week and all that fun stuff. So, all right. Sounds good. Uh, yeah. Enjoy the dog and uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right. See you, Matt. Take care. Bye.